Okay, so you are, are you know, you wanting to promote this work and the history and get people visiting. That's right. So you've got to go to the biggest exhibition and in the UK, in London. It's great, it's coaches, we'll take them round. Right. And we'll take them round in the coaches. We started coach trips going on. Right. Yeah. You delivered your brochures to the tourist board in Cardiff. Everybody did that. Right. They had a big stand, and there were tables, four chairs, and racks of for literature. Well, companies hire then that table, or maybe two tables, mm -hmm. and the set chairs as their little company patch mm -hmm. on the tourist board big stand. You see, mm -hmm. they have a little dummy. Well, they had a little dummy Welsh cottage in the middle, mm -hmm. and about twenty of these areas with tables. Well, we hired and or rented one table with four chairs and a sense on this. So you're trying to sell these tours to travel right. companies and maybe yeah. American market, that kind Whatever. of thing. Whatever. So yeah. we, we get along. We stayed in Bayswater for the night. We, we were up there early, half past eight, nine o'clock. We're at the, the place. Of course, the tourist board don't bother to arrive from nine o'clock. They get there. The exhibition's opening at ten. Mm -hmm. There's frantic activity out of you. I don't know if you've ever seen an exhibition before. Oh, yes. yes. And I've all the bunting and bits of wood have been tossed <laughs> oh, yeah, around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, right alongside were skips. Uh, nine o'clock, the open door. Everybody went in, got their literature out, except uh, ours. Ours wasn't there. Uh -huh. Now, it had been loaded on the, the truck in Cardiff and sent on the night before, and so had everybody else's. They all got theirs, but I, ours was missing, not there. So uh, this is a bit like, yeah, phone calls from Clayton back to Cardiff. You know, where is this stuff? Nobody knew. Well, it's on the manifest. It was sent to it. Should be in Olympia. This is cardboard boxes full of brochures. Big, heavy boxes, four large boxes full of brochures. And, and we've got uh, one of the brochures there. So I, I got, I'm looking on, I could see this skip alongside, you know, and these trucks are coming away, taking the skips of rubbish away, ready for the opening. Huh? Mm -hmm. And this is pretty full. So I walked over to it. And uh, I could see, I was looking on my shoulder, I'm a bit streetwise, you know. And uh, I started throwing things out of the skip to see what happened. Mm -hmm. And there were faces glued to the windows of their little Welsh cottage office, you know. And I, I'm on here. I got into the skip and I'm throwing the rubbish out. You know, I'm a nice new suit and I got a brand new shirt and tie. I'm dressed to the nines. I'm inside the skip throwing the rubbish <laughs> out. <laughs> yeah. And, of course, the uh, workmen came up. What the hell? Uh, uh, are you doing? <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah. <laughs> People are gathering around, a lunatic. See? And there, in the bottom of the skip, right. were four large, well wrapped bundles of brochures. Mm -hmm. They'd escaped out of the tourist office at night and hidden themselves in the skip, <laughs> and they were trying to escape from Olympia. <laughs> so I, I called my colleagues over, and we got these out, took them over to the stand. The so uh, yeah, yeah, the bastards, you got it right. So now, out of the tourist board office comes this large man with a big black beard, like a, and he comes over to Clayton Jones as if I'm not there, my colleague. He says, you get these two off this stand, no, I'll give you two minutes to get them off, or I'll throw them off. So Williams, now, who's Williams? He's this guy from the, from the tourist board. Tourist board. Right, so he's tr yeah. trying to get you out with the exhibition. He wants us off. So, uh, hang about, we've rented that space. We're directors of the company that's rented it. Pardon me, it's mm -hmm. ours. So he turns to stride back to the office. So I went after him. I said, hey, you, come here, you. I said, you want to throw me off? You try it right now. Mm -hmm. Of course, I'm younger then. I've got to pop him. See? And he ran and shut himself in the office. He wouldn't come out. Right. So with that peace reign then, we just got our brochures in the rack and carried on. Right. I wrote to Lord Parry, Gordon Parry, a failed Labour politician who three times lost a safe Labour seat, so they right. made him head of the tourist board. <laughs> Got to give him a job. <laughs> and I explained what had happened, and he, he was totally ineffectual, as he Right. right. And, um, they, they definitely tried to sabotage our efforts. Mm -hmm. we'd, we'd have a coach load of people on the tours on the other sides. You'd get to where you're having lunch, and someone had rung up and cancelled the lunch or something like this, you know. Yeah. All sorts of dirty tricks. But um, the research is ongoing. Uh, we're as popular as the rattlesnake in the lucky dip, as I said. In 1986, yeah. BBC London interviewed uh, you in Cardiff. Just yes. tell, us, tell us what happened there. They came to the house and we said, well, it's open house. You can see anything you want. Mm -hmm. Let's show them everything we had. And so on that. They said, would you be prepared to go to the various sites and show the journey, the, the, where the ship arrives at the Oweni River in the records, take us to where the, uh, you know, there's a stone naming Arthur and four of his relatives at Ogmore Castle, you see, just right. upriver. Uh, 
show us where the army gathered to go to the morning bathe and show us where the church is, will you show us around? So we said, yeah. And we took them and showed them around. And uh, so BBC TV made, it, made this piece. And it, it went out the next day on the one o'clock news and it went out on the six o'clock news. The time is 6.16. In common with most historians, the two men believe that Arthur was an authentic king of Britain who gave rise to the legends of Camelot, the Sword and the Stone, Guinevere and the Knights of the Round Table. Laurie Mayer reports. The apparent proof that King Arthur was man, not myth, is kept at the bottom of a garden in Cardiff. This ancient sword-shaped stone inscribed Rex Artorius, King Arthur, comes from what's claimed to be the legendary king's last resting place. The stone is said to have arrived by boat up the Oweni River near Bridge End 1,400 years ago. In their lifelong quest for the real King Arthur, amateur historians Alan Wilson and Baron Blackett have put their interpretation on ancient manuscripts. An impeccably authentic manuscript of the year 822 tells of the body of a very important man with a stone being brought up this estuary. Uh, this is the secret burial of Arthur. The delivery of Arthur's body upriver was, so the story goes, kept secret because his son was too young to succeed him. According to Wilson and Blackett, this is the very cave where the body was temporarily buried. They point to signs of a square-cut grave hewn by hand from the rock. They claim the local church provides evidence of Arthur's family links with the area. Burial stones they regard as vital clues in their historical detective work. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, the stone of Paul, son of Myrick, a brother of King Arthur. At Ogmore Castle, just down the road, they cite another stone actually naming a King Arthmail, which they translate as Arthur. Wilson and Blackett have now filled several volumes with their exhaustive fieldwork and research, a mass of evidence from so many sources that even academics find it hard to contradict. This bleak hillside, a thousand feet up, marks the end of their quest. In a church they describe as the Westminster Abbey of the Dark Ages. Wilson and Blackett claim it's cost them their homes, their jobs, and 100,000 pounds to find this spot and say with confidence that here lies King Arthur. Half Britain was waiting to see it on the 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock. They scrubbed it. Right. So You know why they scrub it, don't you? Right. <laughs> well, tell me. Well, they don't want people to see it. So they, they'd done this article yeah. about the various King Arthur sites. Aye. But they now, phoned up they phoned Alcock up from Leslie Alcock. Aye. They, who is a, who, just remind us who he is. Leslie right? Alcock uh, was a second lieutenant in the Indian Army in 1939. He had three weeks' leave. Instead of taking the ship home to take seven weeks, he took his three weeks' leave, went to Mohenjo-Daro, where Mortimer Wheeler was digging up the ancient city of Mohenjo-Daro in Pakistan. Right. He then came to Cardiff University, where Wheeler had been before the war, mm -hmm. and said, I was at the dig at uh, Mohenjo-Daro. He didn't say he just spent three weeks there. Yeah. And I'm an archaeologist, see? Right. So they gave him a job in the archaeology department. He's got no qualification in history or archaeology. Right. In due course, he became professor. No qualification, again. Right. And for seven years, he took Cardiff University over to Somerset, digging up Cadbury Hill, because he thought it was Cadbury Hill, was King Arthur's hill. Right. But he does say in his book that all the names on Cadbury Hill that might purport to Arthur and so on were invented and forged in 1536 by John Leland, the king's antiquary. So in other words, he's wished in everything. So this is, is, he still, is he still going then, Leslie Alcock? Uh, he, he left Cardiff after damaging everything like that and uh, wrecking, I mean, King Arthur is a Welsh king, you know, someone said. So the BBC obviously wanted to get... He went to Glasgow. And, right. Yeah. Okay, so, so when the BBC came to you in Cardiff... They were trying to get the lowdown. They were trying to get the lowdown, as they do, and but they... <laughs> They then wanted, obviously, a critical eye, and a critical expert, shall we say. Yeah. So they rang him up. From White House. Says, yes, right, let's did. have the other oh, side. Oh, yeah, they did. Let's have the other side of the story because we've got to have some balance. Well, and we've got to have another the other hmm. viewpoint. Hmm. And it, what? So he then spoke on the phone. Was that yeah. part of their well, TV? We were program? all there being quiet. And he said that the inscriptions on a stone were obviously forged because the lettering was all wrong. So they shot off then. They were there two days. Right. They went around the Welsh Museum and other places and they looked at a stack of ancient stones. Mm -hmm. So they came back to the house and said, can we phone him again? I said, be my guest. 
And they phoned up Leslie Alcock and they said, look, we've been around the Welsh National Museum, we've been to other museums and places, seen a lot of stones, there's nothing wrong with the lettering that we can see. Yeah. They said, ah, well, that proves it's a good forgery. Right. Before, it was nothing like the lettering. No, so it's so identical it just proves it's a good forgery. forgery. And everybody was so, oh, so falling around laughing. <laughs> right. So, so do you think these BBC people who came to your house were, had good intentions? They, they were just gen generally interested? Definitely. Right. Definitely. But, but their report was then pulled from the later news items. It went on the 1 o'clock news. It was widely received. Phones were ringing all over the place. It went on at 6 o'clock news. Mm -hmm. And a, a half Britain must have been waiting at 9 o'clock and 10 o'clock. And they, they pulled it. And they showed a piece on Sarah Ferguson squeezing herself into a tiny little aeroplane to have fly, uh, flying lessons right. instead. There we Great. go. Yeah, we all want to see that. Oh, yeah. Um, what an edifying sight. Uh, bomb. So the, remind me, there was a case where you had books that were being stocked by bookshops in Cardiff. Yeah, well, we were selling quite a lot of books in Cardiff at first. Mm -hmm. And uh, Tony went in, he saw Mrs. Bennett in Lear's, which later became Morrison's. A big a bigger shop, bigger shop in Cardiff for books. Mm -hmm. What year are we talking about? We're here? talking about uh, 80, 86, 80. Um, uh, when we okay. published the, the King fourth Arthur's book. Books. And they, they saw five of the books in no time, right, you know. And uh, she said that MI5, two guys came in claiming to be MI5, and she, uh, I told her that she shouldn't be selling any of our four books. And they threatened her, what, well, they are rather aggressive. So right. she said, I put them all down in the cellar. I said, well, people come in, they see a book on the shelf, I said, they buy a book, and the cellar's no good, yeah. unless they ask for it. But I mean, then how does that work Dylan's, now? Dylan's it, opened it, up. Did it, will an MI5 person do that? Say, well, that, I'm say not, that they're MI5? Uh, well, yeah, I don't know. They, they, so anyway, that's what she's told you. Told. So Dylan's opened up a bookshop near the new library. Uh -huh. I went in and I spoke to the, the assistant manageress. I think her name was Mrs. Jones or Mrs. Davis, right? Mm -hmm. And she took 17 books. I went back three days later, they all sold. But mm -hmm. she was in a panic. She was like this. Right. And she said, oh, come on. So I went out of the shop into a little arcade around the corner. It was raining. She said, oh, I've had MI5 in, I've had people in, I mustn't sell your books, you know. And, and which book was this? This was all four first ones, the three big the, ones. The Arthurian and, ones. Yeah, and the Arthurian, mm -hmm. I told his Rex. Right. And she was trembling, she was frightened. I thought, oh boy, you know, this is it, you know. Now, this is something that was going on. Now, the Gloucester and Cheltenham had a shop in St Mary Street. There's two main streets, Queen Street, St Mary Street. Mm. And they had a corner shop in the street. No, nobody looks much in Austin and Cheltenham books, <laughs> windows, right? So we had an idea. We said, you've got a nice window there doing nothing. How about we put a display up of our books and everything and charts? Mm -hmm. I just said, hey, that's a good idea. So we'd get them looking in the window, wouldn't it? I said, uh -huh. So they put a display up in the window. Well, we used to go along and within the days, there'd be a crowd of people looking at all these dynasty charts and pictures that we had there. Mm -hmm. There'd be people stopping and looking. Yeah, it, it it's in Cardiff. In Cardiff. Yeah, he never had this in the British society before. Right. Right. Two guys went in to see him. He called it. We went to see him. They spent forty-five minutes trying to get him to take the display out of his windows. Right. And he said no. Right. And so he told his directors, and one of them came over from Gloucester, uh, Cheltenham. Oh. It's a Cheltenham, in Gloucester, actually, and. Um, saw the window and they bought him a bottle of champagne. I said, wonderful, good stuff. But they were trying, whoever it was, trying to get the, you know. We, the first books we ever supplied to Cardiff Library, we had to go and supply a second set. We got stolen. Right. And the next was stolen. People don't steal a book from a library because they want a book. Uh -huh. They steal a book from a library to stop other people reading it. Yeah. L let's come on to the um, excavation in 1990. Um, oh, right. Now, to tell us first, Alan, about John Carr, because I think he, he, he wrote an article about the, the, the church mm. that you mentioned earlier that you bought, trying to claim it was Norman, is that right? Yeah, well, what century. happened, John Carr, uh, they were going to appoint a head of Cadu, Welsh heritage, really, and uh, I didn't get an interview. But John Carr, who, from Nottingham in England, knowing nothing about Welsh history, he got the job. Right. And it's a hopeless appointment. He's not a historian for a start. He shouldn't have been given the bloody job, but he got the job. He worked 21 years for Thompson Press, so work it out. 
Anyway, he suddenly, around the, before Christmas of uh, 8th, 1990s, right? He's like this, I had to go. Yeah. And it, it played in the press, and it just simply said, St. Peter's School of Montem Church, da, 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 is a 12th century Norman building. Well, people are ringing us up and saying, what's this about? What's he, what's he this one column about St. Peter's being? And you'd a, already declared it to be the oldest church on, yeah. in Europe. No, well, what it would mean is that the Welsh uh, triads would be robbed, because they nominate it as the most important church in the UK twice. The land of charters would be robbed. The history of would be wrong because King uh, Lyru Galathurus could not have renovated it around the year 160. Emrys Wedig and his mother could not have been living there when they met the ambassadors of Vortigern around 450. Mm -hmm. That a uh, mass of histories would be wrong. That's right. Everything would be wrong mm -hmm. if that church is not there. Mm -hmm. it, it's just that the man was ignorant to the nth degree on history. But, but do you think there's an ulterior motive why he's writing that article then? Oh, yeah. I which mean, is what? Oh, well, they, they simply don't want us proving that that church is the place of Arthur or anything right. else. They don't. I mean, so, I mean you've got an Englishman, he's, he's coming to Wales, he knows bugger all about Welsh history, use the word, mm -hmm. and, and he's obviously out of his depth. He's feeling out of his depth because people are constantly talking about us and he doesn't know what the hell to say. Now, you applied for permission to dig up this site Aye. in February 1990. That's right. And the authorities were supposed to give seven weeks to respond. Yeah, yeah they have seven weeks maximum. They can tell you the next day, if, yes or no. Right. And but they, they took 24, 25 weeks. Right. And yeah. so, so you didn't start the dig until late summer because yeah, of that. Yeah, we had angry meetings with members of parliament about it. What the hell's going on? They, you know, they, they were trying to stop us doing the dig. And, and, and Didn't want to be proved wrong. Right, and, and this is where you found um, the King Arthur burial cross. Yeah, the cross is just, there. Just right. tell us about the cross, Alan. Did Richard Melbourne found it. Richard Melbourne. Is he an archaeologist? No, he's one of the diggers.